Shoot. So let me uh, go ahead and start my presentation. We can start with me. That's just fine. Uh, get here and share my screen. I'm just going to stop your sharing and let me share that. Can everybody see uh, the beginning of my presentation here? Looking good? Okay. All right, so uh, as Sue said, my name is Joe Kerrigan. I am a senior security engineer with the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. My role is uh, research-based, I'm not operational security. Uh, I, I do a lot of academic security, but I'm also involved in, uh, in my own research as well. Uh, let's see here, let's, uh, there we go. So normally when I'm, when I'm giving a presentation like this, I like to start off with a very fun exercise. And unfortunately, since we're not meeting in person today, we can't really do this, but here's what I want you to do. I just want you to think of some, some hacks or data breaches that you've heard about that have happened. I just take about a second to think about it. And I'm sure that a couple of them come to mind, right? We all think of maybe the target breach or recently over the summer, we had the Twitter hack. That was a pretty interesting hack. Um, Maybe you think about the Equifax breach or perhaps the uh, MyFitnessPal breach. These are all newsworthy breaches that were significant and I don't mean to downplay them. Uh, and in fact, it's hard to do that. These were all significant breaches that impacted many of us. Uh, but it's interesting when you're talking about a security breach that nobody ever says something like the Broadway Grill in Seattle or Schlotsky's Deli or Mountain Mike's Pizza or Casa Mia or Active Network. Nobody ever mentions these. But these companies all have one thing in common, and that is that they were all victims of a Russian man by the name of Roman Seleznev. And he was what, you, what the uh, hacker community calls a carter. And he was active from 2003 to 2012, about nine years. And a carter is someone who deals in stolen credit cards. Um, they, uh, they, they get the, the, the credit card information somehow, and then they sell it on, on a dark market. There are markets out there for uh, these people to operate. The, the Department of Justice estimated his damages, or they listed his damages actually in, in the complaint at $169 million. Uh, that is just the damages they, they were able to attribute to him. There, he probably had a lot more than this, but when they investigated the Broadway Grill, investigators found data from 32,000 credit cards in plain text on a point of sale system for the Broadway Grill. Uh, the Broadway Grill did not survive this breach. They were actually litigated out of existence because, uh, because of the amount of information that was leaked as a result of, uh, of this, this attack. Uh, the way Roman Selevnev worked is he would search for uh, remote desktop connections on the internet. And if he found them, he would try to brute force the passwords. If, and if people had weak passwords on a remote desktop connection, he could get in. And once he saw he was on a point of sale system, he would install his software that would take the credit card information and then send it to him. Uh, and he had that all automated. He chose small businesses deliberately because they were easy targets. So uh, we're going to talk more about this, but he did target specifically small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, the good news is he was found guilty and is now a guest of the United States government and will be for the next uh, number of years. His sentence was 27 years, uh, but that doesn't stop the amount. It doesn't even help to uh, recover the amount of damage that he did, especially to companies that are no longer in business. The most important thing, and the reason I, I use this as an example, is I, I want everyone to understand that uh, that you are of value to malicious actors. Uh, I, a lot of people, I, when, I, when I speak to them, they, they have this attitude of nobody's interested in what I have because it's, it's not very valuable, but you should understand that yes, you are a target and everyone is worth something to a malicious actor. So let me ask a few questions and you just answer these in your head. You think about what, uh, whether or not you use these things. Do you have a bank account? Uh, do you have a social security number or perhaps an employee identification number? Do you have credit cards or debit cards that you use to pay for services uh, for your business, for your small business? Do you handle other people's information, including employees? Uh, do you provide any service where you have to maintain some address information or, or perhaps you do tax preparation for somebody? Uh, that's a lot of valuable information. Is the information that you have necessary for you running your business. Uh, in other words, what would happen to that to your business if that if that information that data was no longer available to you? 
Uh, do you use computers at all, any, any kind of computers? Malicious actors have ways to monetize all of these. In other words, they can find profit from any one of these, uh, these pieces of data, up the, any, any one of these bullet points I listed above. Many of these actors live in countries with very low income. So I think in Nigeria, the average uh, or the median income is $2,700. So that's the kind of marketplace you're dealing with. If somebody can scam you out of 500 bucks or a hundred bucks, that's a good day for a lot of people uh, in the, around the world. And it's, it's important. We live in America, which actually has a very high uh, income per capita when compared to the rest of the world. And when, when you look at the rest of the world, uh, that's not the case. So we are, as, as American citizens, big targets for these guys. I want to talk about some trends in cyber in, in cybercrime. And one of the biggest trends we're seeing right now is ransomware is increasing a lot. And the reason that ransomware is increasing is because it is effective. Uh, a lot of people... Uh, when they are infected with ransomware, really have no other option other than to pay the ransom. Uh, some of the things we're seeing now is that these ransomware attacks are also being turned into data breaches. And, and uh, that is directly a result of market forces. Because ransomware has been increasing, a lot of people have been also saying, okay, well, if I'm a victim of a ransomware attack, I wanna make sure I can recover from that ransomware attack. So I'm gonna go ahead and have backups of all my data that I can restore once I have, once I experience one of these attacks, well, the attackers are subject to that uh, that that economic force, and they have decided that what they're going to do now is that before they encrypt your data, they're going to steal it all, and then when they send you the ransom note or they put the ransom note on your machine and you start communicating with them, they're going to say, "Oh, by the way, we have your data, and if you don't pay the ransom to decrypt it, we're going to release it or we're going to sell it." So that that's a big trend that we're seeing in ransomware. Uh, they are targeting businesses with a low tolerance for downtime. This includes uh, organizations like professional services, manufacturing, and government. Many of you guys probably fall into the uh, professional services category. You do things for other people. That's professional services. And what's interesting is that they are actually calculating the ransoms based on revenue. Uh, because they know how much, because they've stolen the data, they kind of have an idea of how much they can charge you to, to decrypt your data. They do that investigation. There is a group called the Sedino Kibi group that they are a ransomware group and IBM estimates that they have made $81 million in 2020. That is a lot of money to make from a crim criminal operation. And that is just the, uh, just the estimate that IBM is making. This is, uh, they have probably made a lot more than that. So what we're seeing is that the cybercrime organizations are actually becoming more like organizations. They're organized a lot like businesses. They have lead generation, and these are the people that will send you phishing emails. They have sales. These are the people that you talk to once you respond to a phishing email. Uh, they have service. Uh, they have management. Oh, the service. They even have customer service. Like, for example, if uh, there are ransomware organizations that when they send you the keys to decrypt your data, if you're having difficulty, they will actually get on a, a, a Zoom call with you or a, 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 some, kind of, some kind of teleconferencing call and walk you through the process. They actually have tech support to decrypt your data. Uh, and they do that because they know that if, if they don't do that, then other people will be less likely to pay the ransom. Uh, they have recruitment. This is an interesting new uh uh, new new occurrence. The Sedina Kibi or the R Evil group has put one million dollars in Bitcoin into a Russian hacker website to try to uh, get people to join their operation. These these folks have realized that they have a product essentially, and what they're doing is they're going to a service model. They're doing ransomware as a service. So if if a malicious actor out there wants to start um, being a malicious actor, there's somebody out there who wants to start being a malicious actor, they can team up with the R evil group or Sudina Kibi, and they can say, uh, yeah, sure, I'll go out and find some people to encrypt their data. And they get about 70% of the profits and the Sudino Kibi group gets about 30%. They're actually doing this very much like a franchise business model. Uh, there are other things out there we've seen that are platforms that are essentially turnkey phishing kits. Now, we're all familiar with what phishing is and how it, how it works. It's an email that gets sent to you, but these are kits that include 
uh, phishing email templates. They include landing pages. They include uh, software that harvests the credentials because that's usually what they're looking for with a phishing with a uh, with a phishing kit with a link. Is uh, they're looking for some kind of access to some kind of some kind of service, and they're those those assets have value that the keyboard or password username and password have value. They can sell those and you can buy for about $50, an entire turnkey phishing kit that tells you everything from how to set up a server all the way down to how to launder the money that you've gotten from your, uh, from your criminal enterprise. And it's remarkably cheap. So anybody can just pick this up and do it. And that's really where the risk comes in. Um, so why target a small business as opposed to targeting a large business? Uh, number one, small businesses do not have large cybersecurity budgets. If you are a, a single person operating a business or there's two or three people in your business, you don't have the, the money to have a, a cybersecurity budget, period. Uh, you don't have, you may not even have dedicated IT resources. You may not have people that, uh, people that are uh, IT people on your staff. You probably don't if you're a very small business. You, pr you probably pay somebody for that service if you don't do it yourself. Uh, they don't have the dedicated security resources. Um, so this is kind of a reiteration of the, of the previous point. But, but here's, here's the other side of that token. By the same token, your assets are typically less valuable, right? Um, so if you look at the target breach, uh, the assets there were valuable because they were so large. A, a credit card uh, number sells for about five bucks on, on the dark web if it's good. And if I can get a million of those or however many million, that's a, that's a big payday. But if I go into a small business, I may only get 10, 20 of those. Uh, so that means that I'm going to want to get in there and move quickly as an attacker. I'm not going to want to spend, I'm not going to do what the attackers in Target did. I'm not going to spend an entire summer going into your network, establishing uh, presence and, and persistence. I'm just going to try to get you to, to, to give me the information as quickly as possible. So the economics of this will always count in terms of prevention. Uh, so make it as difficult for the malicious actors as you can. And in that vein, what is the biggest threat for the small business? And it is quite simply social engineering. And that's a fancy term. I, I don't know why we call it this, but we do in, in the industry. But it's essentially getting you to act in a manner that's against your interest. Uh, and the way it will manifest for businesses is most often just scams. And there are tons of ways that you're, you, people are scammed. Um, and we talk about that on the Hacking Humans podcast. But basically, here's how it works. Very simply, they, they try to get you to short circuit your thinking with some kind of emotional trigger. And we all have emotional triggers. In fact, uh, on, on the podcast, I frequently will say, uh, or occasionally I'll say, this is something that would absolutely work on me. Um, and one of the one of the prime examples is not actually a, 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 a phishing scam, but it's a it's a it's a con artist scam or a pickpocket scam. If if I'm with a child, let's say I have one of my kids, my kids are grown now, but let's say I'm younger and I have younger kids. There's a scam where uh, they would take a they would target a kid and spray mustard on a kid, right? And then the kid goes up to his parents, and while the parents bend over to get the mustard off the kid, that's when they pick the parent's pocket. And that is absolutely something that would work on me. It, it, would, it, would, it would be something that would I'd lose my wallet in that case. So they short circuit your, your thinking with these emotional triggers. And the, uh, they're usually using something like fear or greed. Uh, that's the two, big, the two big things they, uh, they use. And there almost always is some kind of artificial time constraint, like you need to handle this today. Uh, and then the other thing, the other element of this is isolation. They're going to try to say, don't talk to anybody about this. Okay, so use these three items as red flags. So if you see someone is, is appealing to your fear or your greed, if they're, if they're telling you something needs to be done almost immediately, and they're trying to tell you not to talk to other people, this is probably a scam. That's the way scams operate. Um, why do people do this? Why, why is this so prevalent? It's because it's fast, cheap, and effective, and it can be conducted with, by anybody with little or no technical expertise. This harkens back to the, uh, the phishing kit I was talking about. Uh, in 95% of all cyber events, an email is the first thing that the attackers uh, do to get into the company. They, they may do a little bit of reconnaissance, beforehand. In fact, if they're going like in Target, they did a lot of reconnaissance. Uh, but the first thing they're going to do is they're going to send an email. 
All right. Uh, so social engineering attacks come in a, a bunch of different shapes and sizes. We have phishing and spear phishing. Uh, basically, phishing is I'm going to send out a bunch of emails and see who responds. Spear phishing is I know who I'm going to target and I'm going to write an email specifically for them. And uh, I'm going to, to try to get them to respond. Uh, this is another, another thing that we're seeing a lot more of is impersonation and particularly with business email compromise. And while this may not be something that happens in your organization, it's not just something that uh, you'll be vulnerable from, from that perspective. It can happen in an organization with whom you do business. Uh, these folks have gotten a lot better over time, these, these impersonators. Uh, they are very good at mimicking the language and style of the people they're impersonating. So you will not even know that you're not speaking to somebody if, they're, if they've been victimized by a business email compromise attack. Uh, they strike at exactly the right time. So the way this works is, let's say that you're talking to a, um, a, a company with, you, with whom you do business that provides you maybe uh, materials for your business. And you will send an email that says, okay, I want to go ahead and purchase uh, $1,000 worth of this supply. You'll get an email right back immediately that says, that's great. Just wire the money to this account and we'll, we'll send you the supplies. Um, whenever there's anything like that, we'll talk more about how to prevent this, but but you should be aware that that might be a scam. Uh, vishing is just another fancy term for phone scams. You'll get a lot of these phone calls. They'll just dial at random and they'll try to uh, they'll try to take advantage of you. This is typically something that older people are more vulnerable to. Uh, I've heard a lot of stories about older people getting hit by vishing scams. Remember that distraction is a big factor um, on whether you click a link. So when you're going to be responding to your email. Uh, just take a time, take that time to be dedicated and focused on your email. Don't try to multitask. Don't try to, to uh, do other things. Just be present when you're looking at your email. That will protect, protect you uh, a lot. It's very, very practical advice there. So here's a current example. Sue actually sent this to me. Um, this came from uh, some scammer pretending to be a, uh, with the Small Business Administration. And they are talking about the Paycheck Protection Program and this is a program that the uh, that the government offered, and they're they're essentially saying uh, you have been given this loan by mistake, and you need to give us the money back, right? If you respond to this email at sbaattorneys.com, which is a domain that they've purchased, which is not a not not the legitimate domain, but it is a real domain on the internet, uh, then you'll start getting uh, processed in their sales organization, essentially, uh, and. and I, want, I highlighted a few things here. Number one, I, I highlighted the, the very convincing looking domain name up here. Uh, I also highlighted, highlighted down here the impending consequences of an audit and potential criminal, uh, criminal liability. That's the fear factor. They're trying to put the fear of, of you being prosecuted um, in this. Here's your artificial time constraint right here. Since the deadline of May 7th, and th they're saying this is already passed, so you're behind. So they're saying their, their, their artificial time constraint is like, oh, you're already late on this. Okay, this is a scam. Um, this is not anything that anybody needs to re respond to. And it's, it's, uh, it's very cleverly crafted, but this one is actually not very well worded. And a lot of times we see that, but a lot less than we used to see the, the poor wording. So they're getting better at the wording. All right, so what can you do to protect yourself? And I have a couple of options here. I'm going to start with your technology. Uh, use multi-factor authentication. This helps a lot. Now, there are multiple ways of doing multi-factor authentication. Whatever is available to you, you should use it. If it's just a, a text message that your phone comp or that, you're, uh, that gets sent to your phone, use that. If they have a, um, a, a way for you to use an, an app like Google Authenticator, use that. If you can use a, uh, something like a YubiKey, I'm trying to get that to show up on the screen. This is called universal two factor. And it's, uh, it's very good and very secure and very difficult to hack almost. In fact, there, there are no known vulnerabilities against this right now. Uh, this is a hardware token that you enter and you can use this to authenticate yourself to cloud services like Google and Microsoft's cloud services. So use those when you have them available, whatever is available, use it. It's far better than nothing at all. Okay. Implement it in your business and implement it in any company with whom you do business. So they're, you know, particularly with cloud services and banks, because this is what attackers are going to go after. Uh, practice good password hygiene. And by that, I mean, use long, complex passwords that you change, 
with some regularity. Don't reuse passwords on multiple sites or services. And now I, I always have to sit here and wait for the groans when there's an audience here, but th that is a lot of work, right? Well, there's a really simple solution that is use a password manager. This is just, then you only have to remember one password. If someone asked me, what's my password to any of my services that I use, like Facebook or Twitter, or even my bank or anything, I don't know the password. The password is stored in my password manager, which is protected with this key. So even if someone knew uh, the, the password to my password manager, they couldn't get access to it because they don't have this physical key. Automate software updates and don't delay them and reduce your surface area. If you don't need it, turn it off. This, this harkens back to the way Roman Seleznev got into these companies. They probably didn't need to have remote desktop protocol on their PCs. Um, they may have done that because there was some, uh, some company that they were contracting with that was providing technical support services, but those passwords should have been better managed and should have used better password hygiene. But if you don't need remote desktop protocol on your systems, turn it off. It's turned off by default, but it shouldn't be turned on. Uh, have good backups and test them. Now we're talking about uh, small businesses here. So a lot of a lot of small businesses, you can back up uh, your data pretty easily just by using uh, off, uh, what do you call them? Uh, removable hard drives or, or portable hard drives. You could probably back up all your data on a three terabyte portable hard drive, buy two of them and keep one of them off site. Uh, I see we're getting questions. I'll, I'll wait for questions till the end here. Uh, and then protect yourself with your policy. And this just means how you conduct business, right? Uh, train yourself for social engineering attacks if you, can, if you can do it. There are a couple of companies out there that will provide this training at very low cost. Uh, examine your processes for, for vulnerability and then mitigate them, especially when it comes to making payments. Uh, have a policy or, or just a way of doing it. When someone says, hey, I'm gonna change the way I'm, I want you to pay me, don't respond to that in email. Get, get, go pick up the phone, make a phone call, or, or if this is someone you do business with face-to-face, -face, talk to them in person or on a Zoom call, that's even better, or, or over Skype or something. Uh, any unexpected requests or events? Uh, we see a lot of these things where people say, hey, I'm in a meeting right now and I really need your help. Okay, that, that's kind of an unexpected event and request and almost always the lead into a scam. Uh, culture, and this this applies when you have a, when you have a business. But if you're just on, if you're working on your own, you can also uh, adopt this. It's okay to verify a request. Nobody's going to get mad at you if you call a uh, if you call your bank and say, "Hey, is this is this guy is this actually you guys?" Um, it's it's perfectly fine to to, to slow down. Uh, a lot of these scams will become apparent to you that they're scams once you start talking to somebody about it, right? You'll say, hey, this guy is on the phone here and he says he wants to talk to me about this. And oh, you know what? None of this adds up. This is a scam. So take the time and just slow down. It's okay. Uh, develop a business continuity plan uh, and, and prepare for cyber events. And this, this would apply to, to companies that may be larger than the companies I'm talking to here, but still, it's a good idea to understand that, that just have an idea of what you're going to do when there is a, uh, a cybersecurity event. And if you're going to keep a plan like this, remember to print it out, because if you're hit with an, a ransomware attack and your computer's encrypted, you're not going to have access to your, to your plan. So go ahead and print it out. And finally, I want to do some shameless self-promotion here. I, and actually, I, I really think that the Hacking Humans podcast is a great place to start. To start, it's a uh, we talk about these social engineering attacks, and there have been studies that have shown that if you're aware of of uh, how these how these kind of mani mani manipulative practices work, that you're less prone to fall for them. So uh, that's kind of the mission of the Hacking Humans podcast: is we uh, we tell you about the scams that are current and out there, uh, and and. Right now, we're focusing a lot on election type scams. We've talked uh, talked about a couple of election scams earlier this summer. We're talking about um, we're talking about COVID scams. These scams are always going to be timely, and they're always going to cycle through things. Like so, after the election, guess what happens next? It's the holiday scams, and then guess what happens after the holiday scams? It's the tax season scams. They're always going to be uh, so circling with whatever's going on right now. That's why that 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 example I showed you earlier. Is, uh, is probably a very effective example because it has current, it, it relates to a current event that you may or may not have participated in, that being the Paycheck Protection Program. And that's it, that's it for me. Sue, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, maybe we have some questions.
Yes, thanks so much. That was great information. Really appreciate all that. Um, and my apologies to all of the attendees and to you, Joe. There was a mess up on our part, and the correct time wasn't put on the Attorney General's um, schedule because of our mess up. So apologize for him not being able to join us today. But one thing I do want to share, in case any of the participants feel like this is, you know, more of a national or a global issue, it is happening in Maryland. Uh, one of the examples that he was going to highlight talks about a small and medium-sized business that was home run a family run trophy store in Maryland that had a ransomware attack and that ransom was demanded in Bitcoin. And Joe, I think as you pointed out, these criminals have made a business out of their cybersecurity hacking and they did a very professionally executed attack and then they offered instructions on how to be able to pay in Bitcoin because this family probably didn't know how to do that. That's right. So it shut the business down for a week as they worked to you know, get themselves back online, but it is happening in Maryland and it is prevalent. Now, did the business recover or did they did they pay the ransom or not? I believe they did. I don't know all of the details because the, of the, uh, the the mess up on our end where the attorney general couldn't join us today. But OK, they're always going to ask for payment in Bitcoin or in some other cryptocurrency um, because that can be done globally. And it's it's while it's not uh, completely anonymous, uh, there are ways that I can move that money around after I've gotten it to make it very difficult to trace it back to me. And then right. I can launder it fairly easily. Which is why one of the concerns around Bitcoin and, and those kind of currencies are occurring on the federal level, you know, and they're trying to figure out how to regulate and what to do with that. But right. we do have a question. And then I wanted to give another example. And maybe we can talk about a few other um, ways that businesses can protect themselves or get information, further information. So there's a question here about what is MFA? MFA. Did I say MFA or did I not? I didn't say. Mm. I'm sorry. I, I should have been clear. MFA is multi-factor authentication. So um uh, let me let me give a great uh, or a great I talk about like what I'm about to say is, is wonderful, but it's let me give you a rundown of the different forms of multi-factor authentication. So in general, multi-factor authentication is uh, if you think of standard authentication, you have a username and a password. And that's actually a very old model for authenticating. It goes back to the 60s and uh, the 1960s. And now we have multi-factor authentication where you have a username, a password, and then something else. And that something else can come in, uh, typically comes in three different forms. Uh, the, first, the first and the least secure version of that is uh, that you, you're probably most familiar with is you get a text message from the provider. So there are a number of banks that when I log into the bank, uh, I get, I say, they, I click a button, it says send a text message and a, a, a code arrives on my phone and I enter that. Um, that is not the most secure version because the problem with that is there is that that code is sent in plain text. Anybody who is uh, around with a piece of equipment can read that code off the off the airwaves. Uh, additionally, that can be uh, I, I can be victimized by a, something called a SIM swap attack, where somebody takes my um, takes my phone number and then they receive the, the text message and I don't receive it because my phone's been kicked off the network and they, they have said, okay, I'm, I'm Joe Kerrigan. Uh, and now I have, I have lost my phone. Please give me a new SIM. Here's my new SIM. Uh, please redirect all my information to here. So if they already have my username and password, then they can get my uh, access to any account that I have where I use SMS as my two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. Uh, that's kind of difficult to do, but it is possible to do. Uh, next is the, uh, I have one here, these tokens, right? Um, these tokens here or an authentication app. Uh, these are the same technology. If you use Google Authenticator uh, on your phone, it, it's, it generates a time-based code uh, based on some cryptographic seed which is unknown. And if you don't know the seed, then the method is pretty secure. However, at some point in time, that seed has to be exchanged. So if you're using an app like Google Authenticator, that's a little less secure than maybe buying uh, one of these RSA tokens or having something else. But uh, it, it's that's kind of cost prohibitive for companies to offer that. So they may offer just using a straight Google Authenticator app. And, and that's, that's okay, but that seed does have to be transmitted across the internet. And uh, that, that, that transmission is secure and encrypted, but then it's displayed on your screen. Uh, so there is a chance for that to, to, to be intercepted, although it's a lower chance than, uh, than it's more secure than an SMS message. And then finally, uh, the last option for multi-factor authentication is something like a YubiKey, something that uses universal two-factor. This is a USB device that you plug in 
and it's got all the cryptography built into it. And this right here is the user interface. Now, all you have to do is push that. That's not biometric. It's just a button. Uh, and I use this to authenticate to my Google accounts. So, and into my password manager. So uh, I put this into my, into my computer, I enter my password and it says, okay, now we're going to tell you to push the button on your YubiKey. And I push the button and a challenge, something called a challenge response, uh, which is a cryptographic protocol happens. And I am authenticated because I have verified that I am in, in possession of the actual private keys, the cryptographic private keys on this device. So that's a summary of multi-factor authentication. I hope that answers the question, but it is far more secure than username and password. We are, we as humans are very bad at generating passwords that we can remember. Absolutely. So there's another, I guess, more of a comment about deleting the code afterwards, correct? Uh, yeah, I don't know that that's necessary. I, I delete them simply because I clear up my, uh, my, my text messages with it, but those codes... If it's implemented correctly, those codes should be one-time use codes. In other words, I get a code sent to me, I enter it, and then that code is no good anymore. So it's not really necessary. I do it. Um, I do it just because I don't like all the clutter in my in my uh, text messages, but I don't think it's necessary. Gotcha. Thank you. And I noticed that some of the participants are some of our nonprofit partners. And you know, you and I have talked before about our nonprofit partners in cybersecurity. And I just wanted to share that in case you think um, this cybersecurity is only for individual consumers or for businesses, it also applies to nonprofits because- Oh, absolutely. Back in the, I know I've shared this with you before, Joe, but back in the day when we were actually in person in our offices, I received an email from our boss and it looked like it was really from her you know, email address. Yep. And it was, are you in the office? You know, very conversational. And I was like, yes. And then I yep. was like, hmm, she I, I can see her. She, she knows I'm in the office. The next email was because I need you to transfer some money. Right. Like, right. First of all, red flag, red flag, you know, all the red flags and bells and whistles started going off. And, you know, I wanted to respond, nice try, but I was like, just believe it. You know? <laughs> just right. I, I, I have fallen for this as well. Um, our executive director is uh, Anton DeBura. And somebody sent an email to me from a Gmail address that says, hey, are you in the office right now? And I responded immediately, yes. And I, and I, grab my notebooks, because this is something that he would say to me if he wanted me to come down and meet him. So I grabbed my notebook and a pen and I, I went down to, to his office and his office is dark. And I'm sitting there and our uh, head of administration comes out and she goes, I think that was a fake email. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I fell for it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they do it well, you know? Yeah. I mean, so it, and I, I went back up and looked at it and sure enough, it was coming from an email address that someone set up to look like it was coming from Tony. So they were spear phishing us. Um, and they were, uh, they were doing a pretty good job. They got me to just click respond to, to click the response. But in the event that, you know, it was quickly filtered out by our, uh, by our email providers, uh, which is at, at the university. So it, it didn't go any further, but I was totally expecting to, to see them start with a gift card scam. Cause that was the, the rash of, uh, of scams we were seeing going around. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, you gave a lot of great tips on how businesses can protect themselves um, a couple of other resources, this uh, webinar is actually being co-sponsored by the Maryland Cybersecurity Council. And so if anyone Googles that, there's a whole host of resources on that site as well. And the Small Business Administration, the U.S. government, has a lot of um, checklists and different things that people can access and see whether or not they're protecting themselves adequately. But is there anything else that is stands out for you as far as being a great resource for small businesses? Uh, great resource for small. I should have an answer to this question. Um... I, I don't think of anything right off the top of my head. Uh, if if you're going to be running a uh, a small business, I would definitely I would definitely look into finding a company. I can't make any specific endorsements uh, for these companies, but there are lots of companies out there that offer uh, training on social engineering attacks, particularly with phishing. They'll send uh, emails into uh, your company for modest fees that are essentially training opportunities for your staff. Uh, the the one thing I, I absolutely recommend is when when you are doing this, don't make this punitive. Um, use this as a learning opportunity. Uh, don't 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 embarrass people, don't fire people because they fail fishing tests. Uh, everybody is going to fall for a fishing test at some point in time. It's just going to happen. It's really it's you've got to remember that um, 
that these are people who are being victimized by criminals. Um, and you know, we don't, we don't penalize people when they get mugged walking down the street, even though they probably could have done something better that would have prevented them from getting mugged. Uh, but it's, they're, they're actually criminal, uh, victims of criminal enterprises. And so it's important to do employee training. It's important, important to do employee training, right? And then to and then to not be punitive with that training. That's that's my advice. So okay. yeah, and I know there's some other resources on the uh, National Cybersecurity Alliance. Um, the Federal Trade Commission has resources, and then NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, has a small business cybersecurity corner. And then there's a toolkit on the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's website under the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. So there are a lot of resources and it may take a little time to kind of filter through them, but it's really worth small businesses time to go out there and take a look at them and see what they need to do proactively versus waiting for that Bitcoin uh, message that that small business right. is there. Right. Great, well, are there any other questions? We'll just wait a couple seconds, see if anybody has any other questions here. And again, this is recorded and going to be put on Cash Academy. There is one more webinar in our Small Business Success Week. That's tomorrow, Friday. And it is by Kiva Baltimore to talk about how to access affordable funding for businesses. So if anyone's interested, please sign up and attend that tomorrow as well. Again, my apologies to the Attorney General's staff for uh, getting the, the time mixed up. And we will certainly make sure that we uh, get that straight and invite him back on again. So I don't see any other questions at this point. So Joe, just thanks again so much for all the great information. Once again, you're a, a skilled presenter and we really appreciate all the information that you've provided. Thank everyone for joining us today. And I will end the recording and hope that everyone stays safe. Thanks everyone.